Okay, and so with respect to the people that, that are on uh, for 10 o'clock, and uh, it's important that we start. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Villanova, and uh, this is the uh, Region 6 meeting. Uh, our focus would have been to hold these regional meetings throughout the state and uh, ensure, that, um, ensure that we met with each region and with our colleagues to discuss these important topics. But uh, the pandemic has derailed a lot of our initiatives. Uh, one of them are these regional meetings. So we were able to create the environment here virtually so we can speak with you and, uh, and gain some much needed uh, feedback. Pandemic has put us in a very unique situation, uh, but we're very thankful that we have our executive director, Mike Lenati, and his professional team that has done a spectacular job this year, ensuring that all lines of communication are open with the governor's office and ensuring that our needs are met uh, and that he's there advocating for us. So, uh, Michael, uh, you know, thank you on behalf of our executive board and the membership. Um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Mike and he will uh, outline our virtual town hall today. Michael. Thanks, Bill. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, thank you for those who are able to join us this morning. Um, please know that uh, we are continuing to monitor the COVID situation. Uh, if you've read the news the last couple of days, you've seen that there are uh, increases in the number of confirmed cases in the state again, uh, especially in some of our neighboring states. So uh, we are in uh, constant communication with the key people and players that we have been throughout. Um, and just while well, we have a couple of you guys on the line to let you know, we will be hosting a webinar on November 5th to do an update on COVID as we head into the fall and the winter months. So uh, we'll make sure we get notices out. But if you want to save the date, uh, November 5th is going to be the next time that we have a uh, webinar on COVID. Uh, so just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we don't have a super large group and most folks I can see have their microphones on mute. So um, when you want to speak and you can come off of mute, you can stay on uh, with volume is just try to avoid the background noise if there's any. We are recording all of these town hall meetings. Uh, we've started on region one last week and we'll be concluding tomorrow with region nine. So we will have the ability to post all of these on the website. So any of your colleagues from your region who were unable to join us this morning will have the opportunity to go back and listen to any of the conversation and comments. You will also have the ability to go and see what other comments and questions were asked in other regions. So we uh, will be putting that out there as well. Uh, also, we have scheduled for an hour, but we have no time constraints so we can go for as long or as short um, as the conversation takes us. So that's just a couple of the housekeeping things. Um, I am now going to spend a few minutes going, providing an overview of um, the two issues that we want to talk to you about today. Um, so I'm going to share uh, my screen and show you a PowerPoint. So just bear with me for one second. All right. So before I begin, I just want to uh, take a moment to thank our sponsors uh, with their support. Uh, they are graciously helping us to underwrite our town halls today. So just uh, wanna do a quick shout out to them and thank them for that. So what I'm going to do is spend about 15 minutes uh, just outlining what we've done thus far uh, on the two topics we wanna talk to you about today. And as a reminder, those two topics are uh, paraprofessionals and alcohol in the funeral home. I will provide a, a brief overview and we will have the majority of our time spent for questions, comments, and feedback. Um, just uh, as a side note, as we get to the comment portion or discussion portion, um, again, you can just unmute your, mic unmute your microphone and provide comments. Uh, you can raise your hand um, and I can recognize you. Um, and there's also a chat feature. So you're also able to type in any questions or feedback you'd like, and then I can uh, relay that to the crowd, uh, the group that's assembled on the Zoom call. Uh, the goal of this town hall and all the town halls is to obtain member feedback on these two issues. Um, as I mentioned earlier, every region is having its own town hall. The process will be that we will collect the feedback from everybody, and then we will consolidate all of those remarks, present those to the association board for their December meeting um, so that they can review and further discuss the members' uh, first round of feedback. It's very important for everyone to note that we have no desired outcome, defined next steps or plans with regard to either issue. 
Again, this is a first step in obtaining member feedback on them. We have taken no official position on either of the issues to be discussed and uh, neither has uh, there been any legislation drafted or researched. That's important because both of these issues would require legislative action and a change in law to do anything differently. So what I'd like to do is just walk through um, kind of the chronology, if you will, of, of how we got to where we are today. Uh, we started back in 2015 with our Funeral Service Education Task Force. Uh, the goal of that task force was to strengthen and elevate funeral service now and for the future. Uh, I think it's important to note uh, that while the issue of paraprofessionals was not necessarily on the radar or talked about by this task force in 2015, it is part of that larger or bigger picture um, on funeral industry workforce that was on the radar and part of the conversation and an area of focus for the task force when they did their work from 15 to 17. Uh, so again, just wanna show you the full picture. So the area of focus for that task force was in the areas of residency, the education and curriculum at the mortuary science colleges, continuing education and master certification. At the end of their work, their recommendations, um, you can see them here. In the area of residency, they suggested adding a discernment period and increased accountability and structure around residency. Uh, as a side note, uh, we are now just now get at the point where we have drafted legislation on residency to go ahead and try to improve that process. So we are poised to uh, introduce that when we would want to into the state legislature to take those next steps. With regard to education and curriculum, they had uh, proposed a new curriculum for the mortuary science programs. And in the last areas of continuing education and master certification, um, they were recommending new mandatory credentialing programs and higher quality CE program review and approval. So well, their work, as I said, went from 2015 to 17, and then the keys were turned over to the Funeral Service 2020 Task Force, which was formed by the association president at the time. They worked for a year, and their goal, as you can see there, was to explore and implement new programs to ensure a bright future for funeral service in New York State. Uh, they really did, in a lot of ways, uh, expanded on the work of the task force or continued it, and in some places ex extended it um, even further. So, and I say that because you can see there, their areas of focus included residency and professional development, which were areas that the education task force looked at as well. So that's that extension or continuation. Um, they obviously also focused on some other areas that you can see there, recruitment, mentors, and paraprofessionals. So in a way the uh, 2020 task force took more of a holistic approach to the issues around the workforce. Uh, and that's kind of, that is uh, depicted in that circle graph you can see where they took a look at the quality and quantity of the funeral service workforce, starting really with what we called pre-students, which were high school students who might have an interest in attending mortuary science college and becoming a funeral director and putting some tools in place around that. Uh, and then working all the way through to the point where you have funeral directors uh, licensed funeral directors who are now uh, in the group of retirees. So they uh, worked on all of those different components as it relates to these areas of focus. And then in June of 2019, they presented recommendations to the association board. Their recommendations really were to utilize a combination of work groups, task forces, and our bridge commission to address each of the different focus areas. And with regard to the paraprofessionals, their recommendation was to create a task force that would continue the current task force's work in this area. Uh, the board of directors decided prior to creating any new work groups or task forces that they would get more member input first. The original plan, as Bill uh, was alluding to at the introduction, was to gather that input during the 2020 regional meetings. However, as we all know, COVID disrupted that plan and cost us to cancel those uh, regional meetings, which are now replaced by these town halls. So uh, looking at the recommendation uh, for paraprofessionals and, and getting to the point where they made that recommendation, um, it's also important to note that getting to that point, the task force, the 2020 task force had divided itself up into actual work groups and they took a deeper dive into each of those focus areas. With regard to the topic of paraprofessionals, that was done through a specific exercise, uh, which I wanna walk you through uh, this morning. 
uh, what we wound up doing was presenting them with a, what we called an assumption scenario and ask them to answer a question for us through that. So uh, the assumption scenario was based on a hypothetical, which really asked this group to assume that the state association had received notice from the Department of Health that due to extremely low numbers of licensed funeral directors that the department had declared, declared it a public health issue. Uh, so then the DOH is further uh, looking to propose a new license or certification be developed to address the workforce need due to the lack of funeral directors and, an, and a determination that addressing the issue through additional newly licensed funeral directors was not feasible at that point. So the specific question for that group was how, how would the ideal job description and what would and responsibilities look like? What would that be? So the first part in answering that question for that group was to kind of look through the why and the, and the what. Uh, so said another way, basically based on the assumption scenario, why is there a lack of funeral directors and what needs to be accounted for when creating these new positions? So the group's answer is what you can see there, uh, it's that list. So what they said is, as we look to create a new position, the needs that we need to address uh, and, the, and the things we need to look at to create that ideal job description are the following. To spark a career interest in funeral service, ensure we had create a pool of qualified funeral workers, protect families by ensuring that everybody is a vetted and certified professional, to counteract the shortage of um, in the licensed programs, that being the second part of the scenario that they couldn't address the issue through newly licensed funeral directors, um, to better serve families' needs in general, uh, to also respond to the idea that funerals are now being are more involved and requiring more event planning and similar services, to provide an option for four smaller funeral homes who might, due to cost uh, being a cost prohibitive, not be able to hire a new licensed funeral director, to relieve some front and back office in-house out, uh, back out of the house operations for the owners and managers to supplement the availability of funeral service professionals, enhance the role of the licensed funeral director and prevent burnout. Uh, that's more that work-life balance issue. So those were the areas that they wanted to address through any newly created positions. So once they had answered the question of the why and the what, the next question was how. So how are we going to address this? Or I said another way, what new position should we consider? So this group then explored the possibility of two positions, which they dubbed the certified funeral assistant and the certified funeral arranger. Uh, the key word on this slide to keep uh, focused on is the word explored. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I just want to reiterate the fact that the task force recommendation was not to form or create any new specific positions. It was simply to create a new task force to continue their work. However, this group did put a year's worth of time, thought, and discussion towards these positions to provide a framework. So I want to share that with you to help uh, further our discussion and provide a reference for your feedback. So I would like to now just walk through the two positions. I'll go through their duties and some of the education and training requirements. So we'll start with the funeral assistant. Uh, this position was intended to be similar to the other paraprofessional positions in other fields. So you can see there, it's like the dental hygienist in, if for a dentist, the paralegal for a lawyer. I was also told it's very similar to the way that the uh, nursing in, uh, profession is now uh, constructed. I know there's been a shortage of nurses for many years and I believe they addressed it through some of this. So that was the intention behind that position. Uh, so here's some of the things that they would have to do and, and they, they couldn't do. So they would be, have to work under the direct supervision of a licensed funeral director. They would only be allowed to be employed by one funeral home at a time. As far as duties, they could sign out and transfer the deceased from the place of death and assist the funeral director with preparation, dress, dressing and casketing. However, they would not be allowed to transport the decedent to the place of final disposition over the concerns you can see there. They would not be allowed to direct or supervise services, sign or amend death certificates, bomb or conduct arrangements. Uh, the arrangements piece is being handled by the certified arranger position. So again, this was the pro forma or framework proposed. Um, and on the duties that this position would be entitled to um, undertake. With regard to education and training, an eight to 12 hour pre-certification training program would be required followed by successfully passing a state recognized exam. 
The certification would be issued by the state of New York, just like you, they'd have to recertify every two years. Uh, suggestion of four credit hours per biennium, that would include OSHA and ethics as two required subject matter. Switching over to the arranger position, similar to the assistant, you would work under the direct supervision of a licensed funeral director, only be employed by one funeral home at a time. This position, the person would be entitled to make arrangements, but collect vital information, coordinate and schedule final disposition, arrange for the care preparation and transportation of the deceased, discuss and sell merchandise and services. However, they would not be allowed to sign contracts, sign or amend death certificates or embalm. Those uh, functions would remain solely with the licensed funeral director. With regard to the training requirements, uh, 20 hour pre-certification training program, including 25 hand-on arrangements and an overview of the bombing process, also passing that exam and certification by the state, also recertification with every two years. In terms of number of credits, that was still to be determined uh, as, as well as the specific uh, subject matters that has to be covered, except for the fact that there was a recommendation that ethics would have to be required. Uh, again, this is the framework of, that was developed uh, by that work group as a starting point for further discussion. Um, so then as they got closer to making their recommendation to the board in June of, of last year, uh, they asked for one additional data point, which was an initial round of member feedback. So in May of 2019, the State Association conducted a member survey uh, that I wanna share the data, the data results with you now. Uh, this was shared back in 2019, but it has been a, about a year. So we thought it'd be important based on what the conversation is that we're having with you to kind of walk through those again. So I'll, I'll hit a couple of the, of the questions and answers that were included. Uh, this is just a chart to show you both the number of total respondents, which you can see there is 239 who answered. Just so you know, in terms of how we go out and uh, put the survey out, when we do a survey, we do it by member firm. So each year the association has about 950 members. So we would have sent out about 950 links to the survey uh, with 239 responding. That's about a 25% response rate. Uh, if you follow uh, survey data, then you would know that they say that in order for survey results to be statistically valid, you have to have at least a 22% response rate. So um, take that for what it's worth. That would mean that these answers are statistically valid and could be relied upon. Uh, you can also see here the breakdown of the uh, people who answered based on their position within the funeral home. So we asked several questions. Uh, one of them was, has your funeral home experienced a shortage of the, in terms of qualified licensed funeral directors available for hire? Uh, you can see that just under 44% said they had, another 30-ish said no, and another quarter um, had said that they just really hadn't needed to hire recently, so it's really not an applicable uh, question for them. We asked our members if they were concerned about the future workforce. Uh, you can see uh, a very large percentage, 76% of the respondents said yes, only about 13% said no, and then there's that, uh, you'll see there's a kind of a consistent theme, theme of about 10 to 11% that um, are just folks who are not sure or haven't really thought about these issues at the time we asked these questions. We then asked them if they felt that we should continue to explore this topic of the license structure. Uh, you can see just about half said yes, another 40-ish percent said no, and there's that 10% again that really hadn't thought about it. And then although we didn't give them the same level of detail that we just gave you in terms of those two positions, we did give them an, uh, a very high level overview of the two that were being discussed. And then we asked them um, based on that, uh, just if they felt that we should continue to explore both positions. So first with regard to the funeral assistant position, you can see that about 52% said yes, they think we should continue to explore that possibility. Another 37-ish percent said no, and there's that 11% that weren't sure. With the arranger, it was about 35% who said we should continue to explore it. Uh, almost 55% said no, and then that 10% not sure what we should do. So that was the additional data point for the survey. Uh, and that concludes all the information we had to share with you on the paraprofessional topic. Uh, and then just before we open it up for conversation, as it relates to alcohol in a funeral home, uh, there has not been the same level of due diligence or research or effort put into it at this point. 
uh, but because it is also something that would require a change in law, um, we wanted to bring this up with you and get your initial feedback again as to whether this is a topic we should continue to uh, do some due diligence around and explore. Uh, with regard to alcohol in the funeral home, it would really be deemed an expansion of the food and beverage law. Uh, it came up last year in December during the governmental affairs committee meeting in the context of whether uh, someone could even have a champagne toast. And I think it came, it was something along the lines of, you know, we should look at allowing alcohol in the funeral home. If someone comes in and wants to do a champagne toast or a shot of Bailey's or their favorite beer, we're not able to do something like that. Um, so that was the context it was brought up in. Uh, so we haven't taken any further action, as I mentioned, or any due diligence has not no due, other due diligence has been conducted at this point. Um, but we wanted to have a, a conversation with our members and get feedback on alcohol in the funeral home, whether you're uh, supportive of exploring the concept, have concerns about it, uh, some of the questions you might have about it, uh, whether there are any like restrictions around it that you would see or a way of presenting it that you would find that we should be looking at, things of that nature. So that concludes all of the uh, information we had to share with you. So we will use the balance of our time to just allow for feedback, questions, comments on either of these two topics. So I will now stop sharing my screen and I will open the floor up to um, anyone on the, on the Zoom meeting who would like to offer comments, questions, or any other feedback. So does anybody, uh, especially the folks from the, the region who are on the line, uh, let me ask the, the broad question of, that we asked in the survey in terms of exploring these issues further. Uh, do you have a position as to whether you would like to see us explore either or both of these things more, or would you prefer that we uh, don't do anything further with, with either or both of them? Again, you can also type in your response if it's easier based on how you're uh, logged in. Mike, I'll share some, some information. Maybe it will uh, uh, entice some people to have a conversation. Uh, so uh, with regards to the paraprofessional for the uh, certified funeral uh, assistant, uh, you know, we're thinking that a lot of us have come off of uh, the peak of the pandemic. And uh, many funeral homes use the executive order option to deputize an existing employee to help with transfer of remains. So that's, that is a, a similarity in this discussion and what real time happened uh, over the past seven months. Uh, with regards to alcohol in the funeral home, uh, some important information to keep in mind. 49 out of the 50 states allow for food and basic beverage in the funeral home. 46 out of the 50 states allow for alcohol consumption. Now that is either by specific state statute that allows the funeral home to offer uh, consumption of alcohol or where there is no statute in place, the funeral home would abide by uh, the uh, governing bodies and apply for the necessary uh, licensing uh, in each state. Uh, so that is, I guess, some information of, uh, of both of these items and uh, Hopefully it uh, starts some discussion there. So any comments from any of the folks on the call? Uh, Michael? Yes, David. David Parenti. So my, my only comment uh, on, we have to, it's fine that 46 states allow alcohol, but I just think we have to be mindful. Alcohol is a depressant. To bring that into our environment, I think, needs a lot of scrutiny. It is a depressant. So I just, uh, uh, that's my, that would be my comment. Thank you. Not to put uh, John or um, Bob on the on the uh, hot spot, but I know you guys are both from the your two of the region regional members on the call today. Uh, if you have any sentiment or feedback for us on either, we'd love to hear it. Again, no, not forcing you, but 
it's a pretty small group today, so <laughs> I figured. Yeah, I, I was leaving it for, for, the, for the folks in the region, but you know, I could just, we do offer, you know, reception and catering here at, the, at our funeral home. And I, and I just say that many, many times folks are asking for, you know, whether they could have a, some wine with their, with their, whether it be a luncheon or in between the, the, the visitation hours. And we have had many instances where not even a champagne toast, but if somebody liked a particular whether it be scotch or something, just, just a toast. Nothing. I would never advocate for for a full a full bar to be available, especially with as David's stating or having somebody get a little bit out of hand. But you know, we've had many instances where they they just wanted to have a toast, whether it be at the end of the visitation. So again, I could I could speak to that. And I know Bill brought up the deputizing, and we did use you know that, especially under the extreme conditions that we were under. Could not have worked, you know, without it. I know we don't have currently a workforce issue here in our region and our area downstate. But I know, speaking to some folks upstate, it's way upstate seems to be in the rural areas could could be a, a problem. So again, I think we were just looking to explore these these issues and get some feedback from different regions on these topics. Thank you, John Cannon. I see you unmuted yourself. Did you have feedback you'd like to share? Well, my input is just uh, I clearly would have some reservations. Um, the benefit, I think, is uh, minimal compared to the possibility or how it could get out of hand. And I just don't want to put our staff into that type of environment or have an environment where it becomes out of control. So my reservation would be to keep things the way they are, but that's the conservative in me. And, and John, can I just ask, is that yeah. with regard to both um, paraprofessionals and alcohol in the funeral home, or was that just the alcohol in the funeral home? Concern? Specific to the alcohol issue. Okay. Most uh, of paraprofessionals, but I think the task force is doing the right thing and doing their homework very well. So Great. thank you to see how that evolves. Appreciate that. Thank you. Mike, John Kelly. Hey, John. I uh, am kind of, you know, heavily in the support of the uh, paraprofessional uh, program. Not necessarily in the in the uh, designation as a paraprofessional. I prefer to see it as a funeral home assistant. But in any event, in in the North Country, where we're a lot of single owners, uh, no other staff other than part time on call people. Uh, this would give us a, a real opportunity to uh, uh, in, enhance our services to, to the general public. And uh, they do it in Vermont. I've got all the paperwork on that. It's been a very successful program over there. And it certainly uh, helped out the uh, small funeral homes in that area. In the North Country, uh, finding uh, funeral directors is nearly impossible. Uh, several of the firms that uh, I'm familiar with uh, have uh, exhausted uh, resources and trying to come up with uh, some funeral directors to hire and they're just not available. Schools are not producing uh, what we would call a, a consistent flow of new residents uh, that would become funeral directors. And uh, I guess uh, we just need to keep pursuing uh, this, uh, I think, effort to uh, give some assistance to the small funeral homes. And as far as the alcohol, and funeral homes are concerned. Most of the places up here in the North Country, uh, where we have uh, small restaurants, uh, fire departments, uh, fish and game clubs, and others that cater uh, to uh, little receptions after funerals, uh, we certainly don't want to buck uh, that uh, little small business income that they might get from uh, doing, you know, uh, a small entertainment uh, thing for uh, after funerals. So that, uh, that's something that we didn't endorse when it originally came up and, uh, and most of the small places don't seem to want to endorse it now. Thank, Thank you. you. Just to continue that conversation that John mentioned, you know, there's no perfect position, right? And uh, you know, what we do realize and, and what we have realized uh, is that having these discussions throughout our state, our colleagues throughout our state uh, may benefit from a paraprofessional, but not necessarily, you know, support alcohol. 
And, you know, where there is an abundance of, let's just say more, maybe it appears that there's, there could be more, uh, more funeral directors available in the downstate area and lacking upstate, um, you know, let we, you know, I guess downstate wouldn't begrudge a, a colleague uh, in, the, in the northern uh, uh, portion of New York uh, with, for that, uh, to have a paraprofessional option. Um, so I, I just I always encourage people to be fair minded, uh, to, you know, in their approach where something may not necessarily benefit you immediately. But if you're hearing that there's a colleague that could benefit from an initiative or, or an option, um, you know, not, you know, be, keep in mind that you may be that colleague that, you know, a year from now or 10 years from now. Uh, so to keep an open mind uh, when supporting these uh uh, these options. Any other comments, questions, feedback on either of those two topics or quite frankly, anything else, uh, even COVID related since we have folks on the line? So Michael, it's David again. Yes. Uh, you know, I think the Bill, Bill make, make, makes a good point. You, you can't paint everyone with the same brush for uh, things that are positive or negative for their business. I just think with the alcohol issue, big, big picture, um, I'm just not sure it's what we should stand for. It's, an, it's, a, substance, uh, it's a substance that's abused. Uh, we're all trained in grief, uh, grief psychology. Uh, I don't know how you can bring in a depressant product, a product that depresses people it's by its very nature into this environment. Uh, I just don't know that it stands for the right thing. Uh, I, I'm not 100% against it. I'm still open to the discussion. But I think, I, I just think we have to be really careful uh, about what we stand for in this environment, trying to keep, keep people healthy, trying to grieve healthy, uh, trying to provide services to families that that are meaningful, um, and uh, I, New, New York uh, is, is the gold standard in the country, in my opinion. So I think it's incumbent on us even more uh, to be very careful uh, about about the alcohol the alcohol piece. Um, but again, I, I do think we all we all should keep an open mind going forward more discussion, more research, and how, we, how would you justify it? Uh, you know, those are the kind of things we need to, we need to focus on. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind, um, as I, I mentioned earlier, but I haven't reinforced that, uh, we're not asking members to take a, 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 a vote, straw vote, or any other vote. The really, the question right now on the table is, as we move ahead and, and go, the board looks at this further, does the membership support or not support moving forward and further fleshing out either or both of these issues. Obviously, uh, I think John Cannon said it, you know, you can see the work of the task force and the way they're put crafting things. Um, again, we may never need or never decide to, to offer the either of those new positions, but if the time comes and we decide we want to, it's obviously much better for us to be in a position where we were proactive in looking at the issue. Um, same thing with alcohol in the funeral home. We're much further, it's not, we're not even close to as further along in, in that one. That's really in its initial stages. Um, so I think of your concerns, David, there were several other um, issues to keep in mind uh, that other folks brought up. You know, things like uh, just a simple things like on the business side in terms of ensuring you have the right liability protections in your funeral home, what kind of licensing would be required and regulatory oversight. Um, how would it be? How would it be uh, presented to the customer? Would it be part of a package deal? Would it be only offered in a very limited way? Those kind of things are all great questions that we need to answer, but we're not even anywhere near the, the point of being able to answer those at this phase of the process. So I think right now for that one, it was, um, and both of them, it's really, do we, take, do we take further steps in exploring these and putting meat to the bone, so to speak, um, or do we, to say, okay, this is really not the right time or place to look at them. But um, so again, I think it's very important to hear from our members about the things that are on their mind, either things they want us to make sure we're doing, 
um, in terms of anything we incorporate into one of these two topics or things that we should not make sure we don't do as we look at those two topics. So um, just to be clear, like that we're at the stage now where do we or do we do we or do we not continue the conversation uh, into the future on either or both of those. So it, again, this really helps us and it will help the board also if we were supposed to look at if we're going to look at these further. So anything else uh, anybody has to share? And, and again, anything, any other questions related to anything going on in your in your world right now with regard to uh, questions you might have because of COVID um, or anything else that you have a question about, feel free to ask that now. If not, uh, you know, again, I mentioned we have an hour designated, but we definitely have no time constraints on, on the front end or the back end. So uh, I will not keep folks unnecessarily longer than we need to. So give one more shout out if anybody has any other final questions or comments. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, before we sign off, I will just turn it back over to Bill for some final comments. Great, Mike, thank you. And uh, as always, thank you everyone who got on the call today. Thank you so very much. Uh, if there is any additional questions uh, that uh, uh, you have or any concerns, uh, please email Mike or anybody on the executive board. Uh, we're all accessible. Uh, we're excited to uh, continue these regional meetings uh, again this afternoon and then into tomorrow. And then we'll provide some, uh, some much needed uh, uh, information to our members post uh, the regional meeting. So once again, thank you to all of our sponsors that have uh, that underwrite and always support the state association. Thank you to Mike uh, for again presenting. Um, you can smile, Mike. It's okay. Don't be so. There you go. Very good. Nice smile. All right. Very good. So listen, folks, have a great day. Be safe. Keep your family safe. Keep your community safe. And we're here to help you. So thank you very much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.